I, I was saying right before Chip joined, I was I was bashing some some electric car companies, and one of them, you know, I just recently had a, a newborn. She's uh, six weeks old on Sunday, so I needed to upgrade from my Model Three chip to something a little bit bigger for the family. So I went on my my EV hunt, and it's not very extensive because there's not that many <laughs> options for SUV based <laughs> SUVs. But you know, I was talking to someone who had a one of the Rivian trucks for sale. So it actually wasn't the SUV because I wanted to actually try and test drive one of them. But basically he was just literally like bashing Rivian. It's like, yeah, they have all sorts of weird issues where like the battery won't charge sometimes. And like, I've had a lot of people tell me that like these trucks haven't been doing really well lately. Mm-hmm. And like, he's like, I had this truck for three months and haven't had anybody come and look at it. Uh, so I don't know, but I just thought it was interesting given that you work both at Rivian and Tesla. I'm a, te- I have a Tesla, love Tesla. I had a model three, have, have my model X. Like I'm a big fan of EVs in general. Uh, but yeah, curious to hear your thoughts on that, knowing both worlds Yeah, and you own a Rivian apparently. Yep. This is the second Rivian. So that's how things are going. <laughs> as, as in the first one had to be fully Correct. swapped yeah, out. Yeah, I had, I had VIN 558 and it was a lemon and they were unsuccessful. See, it was great. It was like the best car ever for 7,500 miles. Yeah. And then yeah. just weird stuff just started to pop up and yeah. they couldn't troubleshoot it. It was, believe it or not, the 12 volt system that kept taking the 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 truck out of commission. Thankfully it always happened in my driveway, especially considering they've gone to the Grand Canyon, to Sedona, to, you know, Yosemite. And it just, and we tow trailer with it. It's the workhorse that hauls my lumber back and forth from a property that we're homesteading in the Sierras. Anyways, I, I'm, there's a lot we're going to cover here, but the, yeah. So they, I mean, the truck needed to get replaced because we'd lost confidence. It was in the shop for like 45 days but, and this is Teridian's credit and why we are in number two and haven't sold it, is they owned all of their problems. They didn't make them mine. Even in that lemon process, it just took a letter from me. I didn't have to get a lawyer involved and they had already started the the the, the asset swap process, which was a pain in the ass. And, you know, keep in mind, it's like none of this is fun because... You know, when you don't have extra vehicles and you have kids and you have a partner that works, like one vehicle down is a huge, huge problem. And if you don't live within an hour of the Rivian service network, like you're going to have a bad time. But anyways, they, they took care of us and maybe it had something to do with the strongly worded letter that I wrote or that they know the industry that I work in. Uh, but you know, they, they did their, they did, they owned their mistakes and didn't make them mine. So that's, that's the biggest thing I can say thanks for, but you know, they're not perfect and they are just starting out their journey of making vehicles at scale and they're, they're still working the kinks out. So in regards to the fit and finish on VIN number two, or rather 4,289 or something, they, there's still quality issues, body panel gaps that are not desirable and and thankfully they're they're owning those those warranty things as well but at, in terms of what you're looking for it meets the bill it is the mclaren of off-roading it goes zero to yeah. 60 in three seconds with all terrain tires uh and it's got an onboard air compressor seven seven oh, seats yeah. it's got all the power you could ever want and i mean you you know the specs but like in in driving it, it is worth it is worth fighting through all those things that my wife and I had to deal with just to get one that works because it's just that compelling. Yeah, I agree. Like all the stuff that the Rivian had from what I was looking at was like, yeah, this is a really cool one. If you for me, it was more of like the work element, like you're saying, having the tires being able to haul things, like move stuff around a little bit more of that that capacity versus like the Tesla, which is much more of like a, a little bit of an everyday car yeah. for me. But yeah, I mean, I don't know, man, like the, my whole gripe about the whole electric EV world. So the first thing I'll say is I had a 2021 Model 3 and then I switched over to a 2020 Model X. The way Tesla does it, like they have their like models change every like two or three years. So it's not like every year. And there's a big difference between the 2020s and the 2021 from a technology perspective. And one of the biggest things is the battery. Like my X says the range is like 300 and my Model 3 was 300. 
my model three was like a real 300 mm -hmm. mile range. My X, like that 300 mile range is probably like 160. I'm constantly changing it, you know? And like, my gripe is like, why the hell do we not make bigger batteries? Like I want a four to 500 mile radius mm -hmm. battery. And then my other biggest thing is like, I need a fucking SUV. I need something big. I need a Yukon, <laughs> electric Utah with like a 400 mile radius so I could put three kids in there and like my dog and all the other shit. So that's where I'm really waiting for. So like once that comes, that's what I'm going to get my wife. This was like a replacement for my Model 3 because we already have another gas SUV. Um, but like that's really what I want to see. You know, I don't know. You probably know more about what's going on there with the batteries and what size are coming down the pipeline, but I'm guessing they have to be getting close to that. Yeah, right? I mean, the bigger the car, the less efficient it is. And so if you want a 400 mile range on a toaster oven on wheels, you're going to have a huge <laughs> battery as compared to a 400 mile, you know, like water yeah, droplet dude. on the Model X. It's going to be like 20,000 pounds yeah. or something. Like what are those Hummers like 10,000, 5,000? The R1S is 4,900 pounds dry curb weight. And yeah. It's a toaster oven on wheels. So like there's no arrow. So it's hey. got a hunt like the small battery for the Rivians starting out are 135 kilowatt hours. Your model X yeah. maxes at a hundred. So, um, yeah. you know, th this is where, again, there's like varied perspectives and business, yeah. uh, beliefs. So Tesla has yeah. always been like over promising and under the delivering. And you saw like yeah. the, the 2020, 2021 yeah. tipping point. For sure. Was that when they really kind of changed that culture yeah. under promising or sorry, over promising and under delivering because the model three has a, as, as high touch as the model X and early model S owners were, they're affluent enough to not like to be able to float when, when your product doesn't hit its mark. But when somebody who's on a budget buys a model three and they're maxing their budget, you need to deliver. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, so that's, that's a bit of the early adopter type thing of like, you exactly. expect it to come with defects or problems because you're buying into the belief in the future and you want to be part yes. of that change. But if you're actually mass market or like the early curve, of exactly. mass market, you, need to, you need to deliver. But even that. so like Rivian's halo, halo products, they take a very different approach. So they know that they're not going for the efficient market. They're targeting the, the utility market, which is just for that yeah. purpose ex exclusively. Um, and so they have they have a very different like culture in the company too. And it's one where they really pride themselves on being able to delight and surprise. So over the six months of having our Rivian, our range has been increasing as they've been proving out and you know polishing their software, removing those parasitic draws and nothing's changed. Like, so they, they left enough headroom to be able to actually improve their customers which out without having to do it directly with exactly the hardware, because right? they had such a, a conservative approach towards their efficiency and their you know range like they also have such a really demanding use case where you're like off-roading out into the wilderness you cannot yeah. overestimate how far you can go otherwise people are going to be stuck in the desert and you know, it's, that's not going to be fun. Yeah, that's a, uh, if your entire business model is, Hey, take this yeah. off roading. And then, Oh wait, it broke down in the middle of nowhere and there's no support. <laughs> exactly. And you're fucked. That's not you're exactly have great. A bad time. <laughs> yeah. Especially when you're competing yeah. with the likes of yeah. Tesla, whose hardware and software platform is like dialed comparatively. Honestly, I would have bought a Rivian probably if there's like one of the, probably the biggest catalyst where it is. The bucket talk to <laughs> Now, maybe if I talk to Chip, but the bucket <laughs> seats. So like the Tesla X has kind of those bucket seats where then it makes it really accessible, but access the seventh row. I have like an Actra on DX with a, with a, with a seven seat third row. Dude, it's so hard to put people back there. Like it's not mm -hmm. happening. It's like, especially not big people like me or older people, but like with the X, it makes it so convenient to have the two captain chairs and you can actually utilize that row and you still have like plenty of room. If the Rivian had that in SUV. It would have been, it, it probably would have been a bit different. You just got to come, got to go to a Rivian service center and climb into their third row. It It's really, it's oh, really yeah. hard to convey. Yeah. Uh, but I yeah. like, we were in Yosemite this last week and I opted, I'm six foot two and I opted for the third row because yeah, I mean, yeah. I was just having a good time, like playing with the baby who was back there as well. Yeah. But like, 
I've got two car seats, one one right behind the driver's seat when I'm driving, and then in the third row behind that car seat, another baby rear facing baby seat. Yeah, oh, really? and and I have the longest. You have a ugly. rear facing one in your yeah, third row. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it is a suburban. It is the Yukon of EVs. Oh. It's early days, and you, you you need to be close. So you're in Philly. You're fine. Catch Rich up on like the entire like your whole vision is fucking awesome. Uh, explain the whole Sierra's move, the vision for what you're doing, the shift from you know working full time to doing some contracting to kind of where yeah. you're going. Because I think it's I think it's really cool to kind of get yeah. Thanks, e, that's uh, kind, and I think it is cool. So it's <laughs> it's fun to know it other people cool. think it's so. Two years ago, my wife and I bought like I said, just under ten acres in the Sierras, and it's completely undeveloped. It's just trees. And it's off a county road near the end of a cul-de-sac. And, you know, that process took us, like, no kidding, two or three years to find that place and to close on it. And 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 this is going to be the, the, the canvas on which I achieve those life goals of building a structure, a dwelling for me and my family, proving the case that renewables are, are can support an EV lifestyle. Um, building out a solar pan, a solar array to produce most of the, the the property's energy needs, to charge the vehicle, to run to run the power for those high amenity air conditioning. Because the thing is, like the reason why the future is high energy is because we have no control of our climate anymore. We are just passengers on this on this journey, and as temperatures increase, access to resources become more and more difficult and the, the the environment becomes more and more extreme, our biology is not going to keep up. So we're going to have to man, manage our, our lived environment, our built environments with increasingly heavy reliance on, on energy. So, so anyways, that, there's solar, but then there's going to be a small battery bank as well. And I'm focusing on a system that is going to be easy for people to maintain because at the end of the day, I'm doing this myself and I want this to be accessible and maintainable for people. Um, so using lead acid batteries, AGM batteries for that battery bank is again, avoiding the, the, the concerns of those heavy metals, those precious minerals, and it's just much more stable chemistry. So you don't have to worry about burning your house down because these batteries are tried and true. So that's the goal. And then how do we deliver on that? And in California, as you know, housing is ridiculously unaffordable. I start, I launched this Patreon to proof the case of like, how cheap can you build a house for yourself off grid? Interesting. Especially and in California, in California, which I, I always saw with my mother-in-law and my yep. wife who they owe, like, I'm used to Pennsylvania and I have a little bit of experience developing stuff. And I'm always like, oh, it costs this amount to do it. And sometimes I even think about like, I'll fly my people out here to do it for our house. Cause my wife and yeah. her mom, they're always like every price quote to do anything in California is literally like 15 X what it would cost to do in Pennsylvania. And I'm like, no, that's ridiculous. That's insane. Sure enough, I do a price quote 10, 15 X, like what it would be anywhere else. Which know? is why you have to do it yourself here. Uh, yeah. And it's not, it's yeah. not that these things are overly complicated. They're just inaccessible and, um, and, and, you know, bringing a set of plans or bringing a concept to an engineer to then put together the plans, to then bring it to a jurisdiction, to have them say, yes, you can build this. And in doing so, be able to get a mortgage, get insurance, you know, actually protect your asset because, you know, and, and the reason why, like, I'm so emphatic about starting this project through home ownership and showing people how to build wealth through home ownership is that's just how it's worked for me and my family. Like we have only started to take control of and build a strong foundation of financial foundation for our family when we started to take control and ownership of our of our living situation. And you know, there are ways that we can do this in the most extreme climates, in the most bureaucratic jurisdictions and be self-reliant. And then my hope is that that can scale. And as a function, you know, of individuals being self-reliant and resilient, communities start to feel that as well. And the, the power safety shutoffs that the utilities have to do to protect 
the natural environment from destruction as a function of our high energy lifestyles, like you're going to need to be able to meet your own energy needs, even if it's not long term for short periods of time. And so, you know, taking all of my expertise and how to build things and the knowledge and, and, and experience that I have and delivering energy products, that's going to be open sourced through this, through this Patreon and, and through the documentation that I've been doing. So this week in at Lee Labs, which is what I'm calling this project, nice. I was, I was climbing trees and taking down the dead limbs from, from, from some of the, the, the more mature oaks on the property, because this winter we had a ton of snow and, and a lot of branches broke off, but rest assured that none of that beautiful old growth trees are, are going to go to waste because at the end of the day, I'm also an artist and I turn bowls and vases and platters and, and I make things out of all of those, all of those inputs. One of the things that I think is so unique about your approach, Chip, is that like I, I've been, I, I kind of went down this path and you and I started talking about this kind of stuff like two, three years ago, uh, earth ships and uh, natural building materials, uh, building from scratch, build, like all these different types of things. I ended up spending like a solid month watching some guy do his, his vlog over six months building a house with Cobb, uh, Cord and Cobb. Um, but the, the thing that I think you're doing that a lot of these other people don't do is you're also thinking about the money of it and you're thinking about the business side of it and you're thinking about the teachability of it. And so I think when a lot of others that I've seen kind of go into the space, it's very cool. It's very personal, but it's not a built from a perspective of like, how does I, how do I make this accessible and how do I make this so that other people can do it? And also like money is a real thing. Money is not bad. Money is a tool. It needs to be used. And how can I use that and teach that and bake that into everything that I'm doing? I think that is the piece that makes it extremely differentiated. And it's also just fucking yeah. cool. Yes. And, and so Lodge's point, Chip, like that's actually where my questions were, like listening to you talk about it. For me, what I get is like a sense of like someone who really knows their stuff. And my questions are like oriented to like, oh, I want to learn more. Like, are you going to utilize resources that you have on your land to purely build your house? Or what does that look like for how you're going to bring them in? Are you going to have a crew? Are you doing this yourself? Like all these things, it sounds like you have a lot of thought put into it and actually like translatable way to help teach and educate people. Like I have no idea, yeah. you know, like I would love to learn more about that stuff, even just, and, and it applies to like, okay, maybe I'm not doing a full homestead, but even just like a simple renovation or something I want to do here in my house in California, like what the hell do I do? Cause I don't have too many other options than going to contract or just fly my people out from Philly, right. which I don't think my wife would appreciate having three or four Philly guys hanging out in the house for a week. So, you know, like, it'll, it'll smell different. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, <right>. <laughs> <laughs> they'll bring their cheese sticks with them yeah uh so yeah like what are you like what's the plans for the actual construction yeah. element of it like are you still figuring that out or where are you at yeah I, I i titled the project lee labs because i'm approaching this like a scientist i don't have any fixed plans all the way down to the technology that i'm going to be leaning on so Specifically, the, the, the intention is to prove the minimum, the minimum cost to provide or deliver minimum viable product for people. And so the dwelling that I'm starting with is going to be small, very small, like 600 square foot, a rough starting point. Um, and with that, that's not a forever home. But if you have the ability to pr produce that 600 square foot home, you and you have and you and you do it in such a way that it's modular. And what I mean by that is it's expandable. And how you get to that modularity is a, is is achieved through a bunch of different strategies that I'm in the process of evaluating right now. Some to include recycled shipping containers, natural materials that you acquire when you buy a piece of dirt, of which my property is rich in both soil, timber, and well, yeah, soil and timber and in utilizing cob is a, is a really compelling building material, but I'm actually thinking that it's going to involve a little bit of everything. So the ways that the soil building with rammed earth cob or straw bale, like those are really great because they're low cost inputs, rammed earth being the highest cost for a number of reasons, mostly the, the cement that's involved, 
but Cobb and Straw Bale are, are very, very renewable. And ex explain what Cobb so is. So Cobb is just uh, a mixture of clay, silt, straw, and and to some degree sand uh, and small aggregates. And what it is is you basically you mix this mud with straw together, and you pack these these little modules, these cobs that you then you know they're literally like fist size, two hand sized balls of this material. And then you're you're just adding. It's like clay. Yeah, you're just straw. adding. Is that kind of like like you chip? You, you probably know this. Like, is is that kind of like what the Adobe houses it's, are? It here? Is like, have you heard of like Adobe Correct. constructed houses out here? In exactly. California? Yep. It, it's the it's the it's the same thing, uh, essentially. I'm I'm sure that there are differences, and folks will burn us at the stake because I didn't outline them. But again, I'm like I'm learning. I don't know how to build with natural materials. I just know that you can. And so part of this science experiment that I'm on is like going and learning from other people. So something that I did to, no, sorry, uh, again, six weeks ago was go to a building workshop with a master builder who has spent their career building natural buildings around the world um, and doing it. So there was a, a, a build site in Joshua Tree and 13 people yeah. paid $100 to go do work for somebody else. Um, and in doing so, we got to hear from a master builder, all the ins and outs, see and, and dem you know, and, and watch him demonstrate in a building workshop and showing us firsthand how accessible this is, you know, just how to, it was a small project. It was like a little landscaping wall that we were building to produce this like swimming pool that they were working on. And, and they were using this, this technique called super Dobe, which is, just these like long extrusion tubes of, of poly vinyl something or other, you know, UV stable material. And then, yeah. and, and you fill them, they're like sandbags. And then you layer them on top of each other and you can go up to two feet without needing a structural engineer. And, you know, and then you can do landscaping and that's going to be the first thing on our property is now that we've bought it, now that we've got site plans, and we're going to start prepping the, the building site. The first thing we need to do, because it's a side of a, not a cliff, but it's got an 8% grade overall on the project is, is build, you know, flat pads for us to start building on. And we're going to use these, these super Adobe bags to, to do those landscaping walls of which we don't need an engineer and, you know, are, are largely just changing the topography in, in very small and safe ways. But then also we're going to be doing using, hey, so I'm, I'm rambling. The no, it's, it's 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 interesting. But the other thing that's happening is I got all of my solar panels donated secondhand, and this is this how? is how. Yeah. Well, how? I need solar panels now. You're gonna I you're need gonna more. get thirty year old solar panels. Is how you're gonna get them for free. Mine right now are like twenty five. Exactly, years old, so and you just throw them back on exactly, my and you yeah. are exactly how I got that's my panels. <laughs> yeah, so the people that I get that gifted me some these panels had taken them off of their home because it was 30 years old and they wanted the, you know, they were buying electric vehicles. So they just needed more production. And those 30 year old 200 watt panels are now 600 watt panels and their, their array is three X. All right. Well, I may have eight more for you then, because I may be upgraded mine soon. And what the hell am I going to do with them? This is happening at scale, and this is where my knowledge yeah, in the industry becomes, you know, really educational for people. Like, solar industry was born about thirty years ago at scale, and over the next couple of decades, like all those systems are going to be upgraded because people have had them th for thirty years. They're paid off. They've they've already you know, achieve their return on investment and they believe in that future. So they're, they're going to be making retrofits and upgrading their, 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 their stuff to become more self-reliant. And there is not a good way for those panels currently to be reutilized. So t talk through, so you've mentioned not needing an engineer for some of the stuff you're doing, right? You are an engineer. So talk through like maybe just run through who is Chip? What's your background? What were you doing at yeah. Tesla? What were you doing at Rivian? I know you touched on it. You talked about energy and then kind of bring it back to with regards to energy and the future that you see, you talked about energy reliance and the need for more and more yeah. energy. You're also kind of talking about this idea of, well, 
energy in terms of renewable resources, we're kind of getting into mm -hmm. gen two. And if you think about it in a smart way, if you're buying land in the Sierras, you have horizontal mm -hmm. square footage, you can actually use less efficient solar to kind of still capture high output energy that you need just more in scale. So talk through your background and then kind of bring it back into like the future yeah. of energy. So I'm not a, I'm, I'm an engineer by education. I do not have a stamp and there are distinctions. And and so I don't have a stamp <laughs> folks out there that do, you're, you're smarter than me, but, but the, so my background, I went to Georgia tech and I studied civil engineering and through friends of friends, I found myself working at Tesla. I came from building freeways. And now at Tesla, I was building high, like high speed charging stations. They're superchargers. And so not really transferable in a lot of ways. And, and so, you know, had to bootstrap and, and do a lot of independent study on the electrical systems that I was managing and, and really become like a, an expert in the things that I had no interest in learning in college. So. And how much of the process or the playbook was built out when you joined Tesla versus how much you just had to like make yeah, it and figure out? So that's, that's really helpful. So I joined Tesla supercharger team in 2017. That program was born in 2015 and, or sorry, 2013. And so it was an established program in terms of delivering this infrastructure for Tesla. But what they were in the process of growing into was continuing to vertically integrate. So at the time that I joined, I was part of that vertical integration at the construction management level. So my contract- Meaning they had been subcontracting it out and now they were starting to correct. do it internally. They were, they were using external resources to manage all of their contractors, utilities, and the jurisdictions, necessary stakeholders that are involved in delivering one of these projects. And so was Tesla only cars back then, Chip, or what, were they doing like solar roofs and power walls and stuff like that? So they hadn't, they hadn't launched the power wall. Actually, I'm not sure. It might've been right about that time. I know that it was when we had ours put on our house in 2018, it was still pretty early. I'm not sure when that power wall product started, but they hadn't bought solar city yet. And so I was there and I think that acquisition happened in 2018 and that's when they really started to bring in the solar piece as well. So it was just a, a car selling tool and that was the energy infrastructure. They were making batteries, the super packs and then power packs, which are the precursor versions of what is now their mega pack, which is the large scale energy storage product. And, and, and anyways, charging was a really interesting cross section of all of these different energy assets because you know when you're putting in a charger in Barstow, California on your way to Las Vegas, you want to put shade over those parking spaces cuz your car is going to get swelteringly hot. So if you're putting shade, why not do solar? And so that's when solar started to be integrated into these energy assets. And, and as the, 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 the grid operators became more sophisticated in terms of charging the, the, the network operator, the people that operate the charging stations for their demand impacts on their grid, the, 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 the biggest driver on the capital expense of maintaining these pieces of infrastructure was their demand fees. And the way you remove or reduce your demand fees are you put on, you put into that system storage capacity. So that's when those batteries. A demand feed, meaning my demand for electric electricity on the grid. Yep. So in, in those high uh, energy demand instances, you're going to be pulling from your battery instead of pulling from the grid. And in doing so, skirting a lot of those high demand fees. So that's when batteries started to get integrated into charging infrastructure. Um, and when you put together the whole, the whole ecosystem of solar generate, you know, generation, storage, and consumption, which are your cars and the charging, you, you can really paint that picture for the customer of like what renewable energy can do. And so, but all of that's largely marketing, except for the battery. The, 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 the solar canopies are only valuable for the shade that they provide their customers. They, they really are just kind of like pissing in the wind when it comes to making an impact on how much power. Is That's like what my solar does. It just pisses in yeah. the wind. I don't have a battery, so I still pull from the grid pretty much every exactly. day. But like, you know, it's 
it's somewhat out of an offset, yep. right? But and you have increasing like, demand to upgrade too, because you system. drive two electric vehicles. So when that yeah, and my my wife and I use a lot of electric compared to the person before us who had four kids. Exactly. Like we use like triple what they used. Yeah. Okay. So you know you're you're exactly those kinds of use cases that are going to be re- retiring those 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 assets that have reached their useful life cycle for you, but they haven't been spent entirely. Um, and so, you know, same thing with the recycled shipping containers, they still have value, but they aren't valuable to the people that are stuck holding the bag at, at the ports. So there's an imbalance in their value for society as a, as a module to build a home. And the other thing that I was really drawn to, sorry, circling back on the, on the, on the, the homesteading project, the county that I own property in it is called Madeira, which in Spanish is wood. So it's just fire country. And, and I don't, I don't want to build it. I don't want to sink capital into something that's going to be gone the next time a fire blows through. And it's not if it's when, and so, you know, how do you think about that? Using that was why I was drawn to the shipping containers as a, as a building block, because at the end of the day, it's going to get really hot in there, but you know, unless it's a, a, you know, 1600 degree fire, which you won't get with natural wood burning, that structure is going to survive and you can at least rebuild um, or not experience a total loss. But here's where the the dirt and the natural materials come in. Those shipping containers are horrible insulators, but soil, cob, rammed earth, they can be really nice insulators and, and, and also really, really awesome energy sinks in terms of thermal energy. They can store the sun's energy and then leach that into the building when the sun goes down and you can still maintain a high amenity space, but with lower energy demand. Anyways, it's also going to make it a little bit more of a bunker so that you can like shelter in place if the fire catches up to you and you can't evacuate. You need a place to like hunker down in place. Um, so that's. Ooh, I have a question. Yeah, go that. for it. I have a question on that. Have you ever thought about actually constructing something underground? Yep. This is shipping containers are really bad for that because they were never designed to be buried. But if you build a yeah, a bunker out of either reinforced concrete, concrete um, see, but now we're getting into new, you know, dedicated materials that are purpose built for the super high energy. You know, the intrinsic embodied energy of concrete is very high. So if the goal is to also mitigate your impact on on carbon emissions, there's there's a big cost to building with concrete and reinforced concrete even more so because the embodied energy of reinforcing steel is even greater than that of concrete. So in terms of building cost, I mean, I think it's interesting that you said like the embodied energy building cost. So you're not thinking about this just from a monetary perspective. You're also thinking about it and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the total amount of energy that goes into creating those materials. And if you're recycling a shipping container or something else or solar panels that have already been made and they're just going out to the trash, then there's basically zero energy cost because you're not building something new. Whereas with concrete or the reinforced bar or whatever it is, the iron that goes into it, uh, someone is manufacturing that, they're smelting it, they're mining it, they're shipping it, they're pouring it, they're all that kind of exactly. stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. It, it's it, it's interesting too because the other component that I was gonna like I was thinking about asking you about is how do you prioritize convenience and like quality and comfort over like in your equation? So for example, is like you could make a bathroom right out of digging a hole and very basic simple kind of water system for whatever you want to do for processing mm-hmm. or do you even think about trying to put a little bit of a higher thing obviously like running plumbing and having you know water like that's maybe not possible or capable unless you do it well i don't know but like how do you balance that equation because like in theory your equation of like the fire thing you could just use all the materials from your land build a wood structure to cook it burn down be gone it's way cheaper probably or not way cheaper, but it's cheaper than even if whatever it costs you get shipping containers, unless you get them for free. But like you're still factoring that into the, the equation more so than even cost, right? Yeah, and and there's 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 definitely an element to this project and my stage in it where you know I can easily get stuck in analysis paralysis. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> that's what that yeah so at the end of the day like i keep having to remind myself like do not let perfect be the death of good and yeah. and the other benefit that i have and 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 this is a this is a luxury that a lot of people that really need a low cost housing solution don't necessarily have is time. Um, I own the dirt and I have a house that is not contingent on me moving there. So in in this process, I'm I'm taking my time to balance these these costs and benefits, but at the same time, having the luxury of not being in a buyer's market, I can wait for those opportunities to present themselves, such as this solar donation, very circumstantial timing dependent opportunity that because I have this project going and I know people that are a part of these projects, you know, I, I, I was able to capture that opportunity and have that decision made for me instead of being stuck with like, which panels are, are the best ones for my specific use case. I didn't have to make that decision. I just took what was donated to me. Um, and then, and then I'm going to build around that. And, and, and so, you know, to your question about building out of the lumber that's on the property, yes, it is absolutely possible. And just so happens there's a lump, a timber mill right on the same road. So it's, it's very possible. The, the trick with that is I do want the, 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 the accessibility for folks that don't have 10 acres, like in, by my estimations, you really only need two to be able to be self-sufficient with adequate ground square footage to produce your own energy needs and generate the amount of sustenance to support a single family, you know, homestead. But you're not going to be able to buy a two-acre parcel that's got a house worth of, of timber in it. Um, so that that's not really like everybody's possible. That's not really an option for everybody. And, you know, not only that, I'm not doing this, like I'm not, I'm not pioneering homesteading. I'm not pioneering building with modular, you know, recycled shipping containers. I'm not even pioneering microgrids. What, I, like, like Elijah said, the purpose of this project is to educate and inform and enable people to do this for themselves. And so, you know, focusing on 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 the 600 square foot size is really what feels attainable for people to build themselves, you know, a dwelling that is going to pass inspection, that's going to be, you know, reasonable to, to, to undertake in both the time, the, the knowledge that's needed, the equipment that's needed to be able to build that structure and, 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 and be that minimum viable product for somebody who's maybe one or two people. And then as your family grows and you're, you know, your, your financial stability increases, you can make those future investments with 600 square foot increments. And, or if you have a parent that needs to move in with you, you can expand your, your homestead or replicate that same thing and build another widget to support that use case. What, what does this look like? So in its final form, so you're kind of doing this, you're doing it through Patreon, you're trying to open source it and communicate as much as possible. And you said yourself, right? It's Lee Labs. It's an experiment. So you're trying things, you're going to fail at things, but you're trying to do it as openly as possible to kind of build this blueprint. What does this blueprint look like? And maybe it's a year from now or five or 10. Like, what do you think this ultimately goes towards? Is it uh, a cost perspective and a like accessibility perspective? Do you think this can be in any environment? What does the cost look like? What is the necessary skill? Do you need to be able to lift 50 pounds or do you need some like baseline engineering background? So what is like the ultimate objective for the finalized blueprint, it's by two acres. This is the cost for that. This is the cost of materials. This is how you do it. Talk us through that. Yeah. So at the end, it's going to be a snapshot of what my project was. So open sourcing all the money that I spent on the project from original budgets all the way through the actualized costs, identifying where waste took place, where, where I made mistakes such that people don't make those same mistakes, you know, that they have to learn that hard lesson themselves. And, and, and it's going to be, you know, the engineered permitted plans for the thing that gets built. So is this, is this something that can apply everywhere in the world? At a high level, yes. And the reason why I feel confident in saying that is I'm doing this in the most cumbersome 
jurisdictions in California and in some of the most extreme seismic and environmental circumstances, such as the Sierras are on fire yearly. And, and it's also some of the highest seismic activity in the world. So those two things are, are, are really nice benchmarks to feel confident that if I can produce this thing that achieves, that, that exceeds those, those requirements, that you can do this anywhere. Now, would I? No, I think that it's incredibly like the the in the intention that I'm conveying in this, and the 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 inspiration behind it is to build off of the natural resources that are local to you and to your homestead. So, I've got a ton of wood in my on my property, and I've got a ton of really great soil. So I'm trying to think about how to integrate those things into my building. The reason why lumber is really tough. Richard, to answer your question earlier, is California requires you to have an architect grade your lumber, which adds to the cost, adds to the complexity of the project, and largely makes it un, uninteresting. And and I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't know enough about the timber industry to know if this is the real origins of it, but I know enough about business to know that government capture and regulatory capture are real. And, and I would I would venture to say that the more than in people's best interests as the people who would build a house that's made out of unsafe timber, it's really in this timber produ producer's interest to make being able to make your own timber cost prohibitive. So adding that regulation to have an architect come out and grade and stamp your lumber, you know, put it under undue scrutiny when at the end of the day, I can make a decision for myself about what lumber is good enough to put over my family's head. Um, that would be the, the most libertarian approach, but that's not really California style. So, so I'm kind of staying away from that and I'm, I'm limiting my use of, of lumber from the property in non-structural applications, which eliminate the need for that architectural stamp. So all the finish, all the finishings, the floorings, the, non-structural shade structures, you know, those kinds of things can be built out of the lumber that comes from my property to reduce the cost and provide that like nice to have fit and finish on the interior. But, but it's, it's, it's not, it's not going to be the available for somebody in Oklahoma. So in Oklahoma, you're going to want to know your dirt, like do when you, when you do your property acquisition, take soil samples and, and I'll help you understand how to do a jar test to understand whether the soil breakdown in that piece of dirt is going to be suitable as a building material with cob or rammed earth or, or even straw bale. Um, so anyways, I'm, I'm rambling again, but, but the, 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 it, the spirit of this project is to look to the natural environment that you're, that you're working in and tailor the solutions for that environment. So again, in, in, in Oklahoma, you don't have to worry about the thing burning down. So don't worry about making it fireproof. But so, you know, this is just pilot and this is just one of one. And it's happening in California because there's the biggest barrier to entry for home, for housing. So there's just like with Rivian and their value proposition, in not targeting the consumer vehicles, the, the Model 3 sizes, that space is really competitive for EVs. But for the utility vehicles, you know, where it's this high, a much, much less efficient vehicle, they had a much bigger value prop that could garner their high dollar, you know, price tag. Same thing in California, proving like Houses in Madera County cost on average $400,000 for a 2,000 square foot home. And that's in a place where it's built out of materials that are going to burn down. And so building with natural materials, building minimum viable product, I'm confident that I can build for $260,000 for a 600 square foot home on two acres of land, meeting your own energy needs, and, and, and doing that in, in such a way, utilizing those materials that are there, considering the, the, the hazards of that specific environment and tailoring my solution for that environment. But in Costa Rica, it's gonna be a completely different game.
completely different resources, completely yeah. different risks, completely different energy sources. And, you know, the things, these things. So to answer your question, this is not going to be a scaled product that can be deployed at any well, this is your first prototype and your proof of concept, but like, where do you want the target price to be? Like Tesla started at, you know, the, the, the roadster is a hundred and whatever thousand. And then now they're down to, they just did another mm -hmm. cut. Right. So it's now 20 to $30,000 for, for a Tesla. And they still want to I'm go targeting 65%, where do you ultimately see the 65% price of the average cost of, of housing as, as the price point that, so, and that's where it's really a sliding scale, depending on where you are. And doing things yourself yeah. in a market where labor is incredibly cheap might not make the most sense. You might want to just pay some guys from Philly to come out and to build, to build your shit. <laughs> hey, there you, you know? go. There you but go. in California, it's so cost prohibitive that like y y yeah. your appetite to do it yourself is so much higher just because of the barriers to entry for People like us that are young, you know, like we got lucky. We got we got in on on the housing market before it went to shit for everybody else. But you know, the solution to that problem is to increasing the housing stock. And builders are not doing that because they don't. There's so much uncertainty in the market. They don't know what whether their you know their house that they're working on is going to be worth two hundred thousand dollars more or less than what they think it is today because of the volatility, which is where taking control of those decisions and those inputs and the and the, the, the wherewithal to like make the thing a reality. That's why I see so much value in making this accessible for people to do for themselves. Chip, I'm gonna switch switch things up a little bit, but kind of in the same vein. I can't help but to think about like listening to all of this for me. Uh, there's been no secret over probably the last <laughs> three or four, maybe even longer years that there's been a more of a, what they would call a migration of folks out of California mm. to different places. Uh, I have my own journeys and quarrels and opinions on California, which I'll table those for now. But my question to you is like, how did you end up to California? You're still here. Like, what do you, what, what are your thoughts? What's your experience of being in California? Why are you still here? How'd you end up here? You know, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. So after college, I had opportunities in a number of different states and I picked those opportunities based on where my, my fiance at the time was applying for grad school. She ended up going to UCI and that's what brought us to California. Why am I still here? I love this place. <laughs> this place rocks. Yeah. It's unparalleled in terms of the access to a variety of, of different natural environments, uh, ecosystems outdoor activities, you know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful place to be temperate wise, climate wise, as long as you're not in the midst of a wildfire. And, yeah. and so that's, that's why I'm here. Why do I want to stay for the, all the same reasons? This place rocks. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's got its problems from a, you know, a, a, a government and regulatory perspective, but I'm actually, I feel like things are getting to the point from a sheer survival perspective and and from a NIMBY perspective that people are are losing the battle that these energy products and these energy projects are are good for the state but not good for their community. They they have to. This is a this is a pivotal moment where survival is determined on people's ability to change the way that they see energy in their lives and in their communities. What, what's one of those, like, it sounds like, again, I'm East coast We're we're all coal every day, right? My, I uh, compared electric bills yeah. with rich. It's like one tenth of the price. So what are these energy in my backyard projects? Batteries, Batteries? substations, transmission lines, uh, you know, access to the grid generation on the grid. Yeah, um, and Chip, Chip, talk to us a little bit about because you probably have way more knowledge than any of any of Elijah and I. But one of the this is me and like my very layman's like understanding of of it here. Okay, the way that energy is in Pennsylvania, for say, and the way that the infrastructure was built, like the simplest example I would use, like I would say probably very early on, I think at some point in Pennsylvania's 
founding history, once it had a lot of its electric above ground and everything else, and people were a lot more remote, like it's pretty standard that they started to move stuff underground. They started to really kind of change how they built their infrastructure. You look around at California and like what, how, how, what percent, some crazy percent of like electric wiring and cables are all above ground and like the infrastructure and the wiring is just like a joke. The, the cost I pay per kilowatt is literally like 26 cents, 30 cents a kilowatt where like Elijah is paying six cents or five cents in Philly. I think it was yeah, four to seven. Yeah. It's like, talk to us about that a little bit. Like what's going on there? What happens? You know, what's the future? Like how to get there? Yeah. There's a bunch of different things that led to the above grounding of our grid in California, not the least of which is are the environmental concerns of burying infrastructure. Uh, when you bury infrastructure, you have to dig trenches. And when you dig trenches, you disturb soil and environment, natural, you know, ecosystems. Not only that, it's it's a lot more work to bury those wires than it is to slap them on poles and hang them from from treetops. Um, so, you know, there are a bunch of different drivers. Cost of pro providing that energy. I'm actually not sure why the the grid like that that blows my mind like your bills are seven five to seven cents Elijah I'd have to double check but it, it was like yeah a four how much they pay for a kilowatt yeah, yeah. it was it's something like, crazy significantly cheap. cheap and are you Richard are you on a time of use because of your solar yeah I'm on a time of use plan but I think my average kilowatt still ends up being somewhere around 16 or 17 cents something like yep. that you know, I think my 26 cents is like the peak, yeah. right, of my use. But yeah, I mean, like I remember, and I have a property in Pottstown too. So I I work with, uh, it's called Pico. Outside of Philly. Outside of Philadelphia or all of Pennsylvania is Pico versus PG&E is who we have out mm -hmm. here. And I know my electric bills there, like, again, I remember looking and seeing like six or seven cents a, a, a kilowatt and they don't have any, there's no time of use plans or things like that, you know. Uh, so do, do, do you think it's a problem the way the infrastructure is in California? Do you think it needs to change or like, yeah. what's your, what's your opinion on that? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It definitely needs to change. I, I'm, I'm probably not the right person to answer the question. Of like, why yeah. is it four or five X? Um, that, yeah. I mean, my right. off the cuff answer is regulations and, yeah. and monopolization. You know, at the end of the day, we only have three major utilities in California, which is like the Eastern seaboard <laughs> and they suck, you know, like they, they burn down the place pretty regularly and yeah. you know, the power goes out now quite a bit all the, all time. the time, all the time. In the yeah. Area. And so the ways in which really? California's all the time, the ways in which California's I had rolling blackouts when I lived in the Philippines, I didn't realize California well, my mother-in-law used to like, think it was normal. She'd be like, Oh, the power would go out. Like, like literally, like I don't, even, I might be a little sarcastic, but like thirty times a year or something. I'd be like, we have like thunderstorms and hurricanes in Pennsylvania, and the power maybe goes out like two or three times a year. Like this is not normal, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm um, actually pulling up my Tesla app because I can tell you. Oh, because you have the power wall, so I can tell you every yeah. When the yeah, I'll tell you how many so, outages we've had. The last time I had a blackout in philly because i've been in philly and then cities York, also have more redundancy so probably than best. probably suburbs that could but, be that could be yeah. but i mean i i don't think i've had a blackout in the past five ten years actually yeah yeah you've been in the city you know like in east bay in california for people who know the bay area my energy issues are way less than what i experienced when i was living in los altos which is you know more on the the peninsula or a different part of the bay area like significantly different. Like power went out all the time when I lived in Los Altos on the peninsula versus here in the East Bay. So there's definitely a difference in the infrastructure probably. I don't know, but that would be my guess. It, it has a lot to do with like how close you are to the urban wildlife interface. In in suburbia where we live in Southern California, we're so far from the transmission lines that are that are running through the, the fire risk zones that we don't really see power outages that often. I was just looking at, it does look like it backed up like almost every single day for at least a second, but I don't think that those are not outages. Those are, those are just blips on the grid. 
Alonja knows my internet drops seven times a day, and apparently I have like the fastest internet you can have in the Bay Area with Comcast. Yeah. But but the ways in which to answer your earlier question, like how does the infrastructure need to change? It needs we need to be more resilient. Like we need to be able to meet our own energy needs at a local level, and that. Do you think that's possible given that utilities are government run and like it won't be so sure more resilient, it more won't micro. be how does that happen? Only on the utilities. It is in the utilities best interest to make those investments because here's a dirty little secret. They don't make money by delivering electrons. They make money by building their infrastructure and maintaining it. Um, they are regulated by the PUC public utility commission in California which basically regulates them such that they can only charge the cost of delivering their service, except for building their grid. That's where they make money. So they have a lot of interest in adding batteries, adding facilities, adding substations, adding circuit capacity, storage, generation. And so the ways in which things are going to happen, it, and the, why, the reason why I say it's not wholly dependent on those utilities it's interdependent, it's it's intertwined, but people that are downstream of the utilities infrastructure beyond the meter can do this for themselves. Like my wife and I in our home, this house turns into a microgrid whenever the power goes off on the utilities. And that makes me more resilient, sure. But it also means that they don't have to rush to turn the power back on until it's safe for me. And if that's happening at scale, the utilities don't have, they don't have as much hurdles to turning the power off when it, when it really is responsible, because at the end of the day, when we get to a certain scale of, of individuals being resilient, communities become resilient. And, and there's a lot that needs to happen on the regulation side, because one thing that isn't a reality yet is have being able to put in an automatic transfer switch on your house such that you can island for long periods of time and generate solar while the grid is down that's the one thing which means disconnecting from the grid basically Correct. right so being able to manually control swapping off or on Correct. grid you you're not allowed to do that when right you now. have generation so not just a battery when you produce electricity with solar or wind or whatever the the utility for residences does not approve automatic transfer switches which would in 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 reality isolate your service and that generation from their their grid which they have to maintain so one of the reasons why the lights go out. It's because they need to potentially rely on you. In, like they, they might be counting on your en- energy supply. No, no, like no. It's, it's actually a maintenance like safety thing. So if they have a problem on their grid and your house is connected to their grid and producing electricity, even though they've disconnected their generation sources, you might be back feeding power and kill somebody who's working on the line. And unfortunately, like, we did finally win uh, a couple of years ago the ability to get a permit for a residence that is not connected to the grid at all, and in such being in a microgrid itself. But the second you connect to the grid, they need to be able to control your power generation, and in doing so, they have to tie in. So when when they turn the power off on their side to go do work, they kill all the power for all those solar those generation sources that connect to their grid as well. So it might seems like there needs to be like two switches, two redundancies, right? Like one for the house, one for the company. This may be like a very specific detailed question, but like for anybody who listens to this, who would be curious about it, or at least for me with my situation, explain to us, like, how does it actually work the process from going the sun going to our solar panels if you have a battery then back to the grid like my understanding and maybe it's just simple but my understanding is like if you have a battery and you have solar panels you're pushing you're filling up your battery first right and then you're utilizing it from that if you need to pull from the grid you pull from the grid in that instance is that how that works or how does it does it fill your battery up first and then 
drain it or like how's that yeah work? so you can actually it's it's just i mean it can work in a couple different ways and it depends on how you want your system to be operating like are you trying to manage to generate and consume all of your own electricity or be as self-reliant as possible or are you interested in playing arbitrage which when you have storage you can send power back to the grid even though you're not using it and generate revenue at during those peak hours such that you can make money so are you trying to be self-reliant from an energy perspective or are you trying to maximize for profit and so in those two different use cases, you, the system's going to operate very differently. In the case where you're trying to be self-reliant and you're trying to supply your own energy needs, yes, if the battery has available capacity and you're generating more electricity than you're consuming, you're going to send that power to the battery first. And then when the sun goes down, you're going to start pulling from that battery. But if you're trying to play the revenue game, your solar power during the day, you're only going to fill that battery up until, sorry, you're, 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 you're going to fill that battery up not to, not to use it yourself, but to sell it back to the grid when the electricity on your time of use plan is the most valuable. Um, and so in that scenario, you could have a situation where there's midday and there's an emergency power shutoff or there's you know a high demand event on the grid and electricity uh, sending electricity back to the grid just got a ton more valuable and so you're going to send power from both your charged battery and your solar bypass your needs and go back to the grid or at least meet your needs and then send all the excess back to the grid to make money um yeah. I guess it's also so dependent upon your usage, right? Because like, it also, if you're like, if you're like filling up your battery and then using it to run all your house, and then it's nighttime and your battery's at half, and then the power goes out and you don't have your battery for the next day, yeah. Like, then it defeats the purpose of giving you that backup thing, right? So it's like, uh, you got to kind of pick and pick and choose really, and like really calculate it and understand what is your electric consumption, what do you want to yeah. have, what do you, you know? It's like a real, real formula. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing that like people just don't haven't had enough experience with. It's not that it's overly complicated. It's just a game that we haven't played at scale, like in this yeah. distributed fashion. Um, and so, you know, that's like, even with just charging an electric vehicle, there's a strategy to it. You don't just show up to a gas pump with a half a tank and, you know, you don't have to think about how much fuel is in your tank and how long it's going to take you to refuel but you do when you have a battery and you're taking electrons, like the game turns into show up with as low an SOC as possible and stay till 80%. What's an SOC? Oh, state of, state of charge. State yeah. of charge. I percentage Correct. what, what mortals call percentage. Well, what are the charge? batteries actually doing when they're conditioning? Like when you're heading to a supercharger now, I'm not a battery management system yeah. guy, but my understanding is they are. So when you're when you're, your your battery is made up of a bunch of little batteries, okay. And so the the bunch of the tiny batteries are called cells. Groups of cells are called modules, and modules combined together make a pack. And so your pack is your battery. And in pulling electricity from that pack, you're draining, my understanding is, you're draining individual cells sequentially. And, and but, the, oh, but the most efficient way to charge a, a battery is by redistributing the, that power across those empty cells and those full cells, such that all the cells have relatively similar energy energy oh. capacity and then when you plug into a dc fast charger it's got all the cells that it can distribute power to instead of just being stuck with those individual ones that have that have emptied out and the 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 analogy that like clicked for me refueling a battery is is similar to filling up a let's say a 55 gallon drum of, with water when that drum of when that 55 gallons is empty, 
you can put a fire hose on full steam and it's it's not going to spill water. You've got enough room in that battery that it can take a ton or in that, you know, 55 gallon drum, it can take a ton of water very quickly until you get close to the top. And then you start having to throttle the hose back so that you don't spill water out. And in a battery, spilling water is what we call a thermal event. It's when your battery goes boom. And water, you know, electrons flying out of your battery are not a good time. And so in that same fashion, the 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 available space to receive electrons is decreasing and you cannot spill still. So you have to throttle that back. And depending on that BMS and the architecture of your cells and the modules and the pack, some vehicles have a much wider power range where they can receive power for longer. The Rivian is particularly good in this way. And it has a long, a a very, a very uh, square uh, charging profile. Um, So you can pull very large amounts of power till 80% and then it throttles dramatically as you fill up, which is why the game, like I was describing, is like you don't show up with an electric vehicle that's at 80% and just top off at a DC fast charger because your vehicle's not going to even be able to take that amount of power that that would make it worth your while to sit in your car parked. You want to st- you want to show up to DC fast chargers with as low an SOC as possible such that you can pull a high enough the highest power for as long as possible so that you spend less time sitting there charging. Are there other like hacks like this from from an electric an electricity or energy perspective, whether it's with homes or, or EVs, or just like, should everyone just go buy solar panels because they're so cheap and they pay for themselves inside of three years? Like, do you have any major insights for people who are just like, go do this today, get 80% of the value with 20% of the effort? Yeah, it's, it's different in every climate and solar panels are not nearly as valuable the higher you go on the, on the globe or the further from the equator. So, and the same thing goes for EVs. EVs are not great in cold climates. They're just not suited for it. The charging infrastructure sucks in cold climates. The batteries suck relatively. So I don't even see EV adoption everywhere as a good thing. And and this might surprise the both of you, but like, I don't think that the electrification of everything is the right way to go. There, the, the, the process of electrifying a lot of things is a process of diversification, whereby the communities that can generate large amounts of abundant renewable electricity should be the people that adopt these technologies. People that don't have access to solar power, wind power, hydropower, and until we get their nuclear power, you know, they are likely well, best suited with the hydrocarbons or whatever fossil fuels have supported them. And those, like, even if we distribute half of the transportation in this country to electricity, what that does is that diversifies our entire country's energy portfolio. And we can produce electrons here, but we cannot easily export electrons. And what that does is it isolates that 50% of our energy needs from the global commodities that have caused so much turmoil over the last 20, 40, 100 years. Wars have been fought over them. Countless people have been killed in in the pursuit of of these global commodities. Um, And just think about how, like at the beginning of the Ukraine conflict, how, what America's ability or interest in responding to the, the the cost of fuel, if half of us could get on our own with electricity, produced locally, stored locally, and consumed locally. That's that's what this process really is. And 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 I'm not a sycophant. Like I, I electricity and electric drivetrains are not something that meets every use case. It doesn't meet every, yeah, sorry. 
I like the idea though of what you said of like it's it's about diversification. It's not about going all into something else, but just like investing, you don't just say, "Hey, here's this one stock. I'm only buying this one stock, and then that's that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy." oil and everything's oil and let's run the entire economy on oil and then oh wait we don't have oil so now we're dependent on this other person who has oil because all of our things run on oil so it's like it's not just about moving to all electric it's about diversifying so that you're more resilient as a system and even within the electric world you know we have natural resources which is oil gas and coal i guess i I don't really know specifics but it's probably like those three buckets Uh, same thing in energy in in electric you have you have wind, you have storage batteries, right? And then you have all the other natural renewable aspects. Um, one thing I want to ask about, actually, you brought it up is of nuclear. I think nuclear continues to be, I don't know why, but it, it, it it's, feels like a controversial topic. What's your stance on nuclear? The, the, is there a, a piece of it in our portfolio, in our lineup? Uh, or is it dangerous? Or is that all just like, bad information that people have phobias over because it's very public when it fails. Yeah. Well, we grew up 10 miles south of three mile Island. So this, this yeah, is, I was, I was right there with you boys. Yeah. So not too far away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we were taking, I grew up actually by the Limerick power plant. So I was pretty close to the Limerick power plant too. And I remember at some point we had to take some pill that they were handing out in school or something, something weird. I think it was iodine or- and we thought nothing of every, and, and we didn't think anything about it. You know, you're like, oh, this is normal. Think of a pill living next to a nuclear power plant. Now I live in California. I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like, anyway. No, I mean, to your question, and and the reason why I bring up our very personal connection with with the risks and hazards of nuclear power, despite that, those risks and the and the history that we have on this planet with with tapping into nuclear as a source of generation is far out I, I I definitely think that we do not have nearly enough nuclear power in our in our portfolio. I also agree that the way in which the nuclear industry was regulated at its onset was incredibly irresponsible. There was not real oversight Elaborate. there was not real oversight um, the the the, the operators had a lot of latitude and this is, you know, again, where industry capture and regulatory capture is an, an, a force that we need to be concerned about and keeping our eyes on because at the end of the day, people don't get into this business for, for charity. So it needs to be profitable and that's where it's not happening right now because the regulations have swung to the opposite end of the spectrum where it's prohibitive, cost prohibitive, time prohibitive and Capital does not see these projects as interesting enough to fund because of the time and the red tape that it takes to deliver a functional power plant. At the same time, I know that we've come a long way. And from a technology perspective or a regular? From a technology perspective perspective, on the nuclear front. And the scale of the nuclear power plants of the future, I think, is dramatically different than the past. This is, I see a lot of really interested in the distributed nature of micronuclear plants. Um, Again, for those purposes of being resilient and not having large choke points or targets for an adversary to just, you know, to bomb three major nuclear power plants in in a country is a lot easier than doing it on the scale of thousands of distributed energy sources. Um, And that's like, to the, to the point where a lot of the fossil fuel naysayers have a really good point is our grid is incredibly, incredibly vulnerable. And that's not just nuclear power plants themselves, but the poles and wires that carry power from, say, the Hoover Dam to Southern California. You can see them, they're unexposed, and you can, you know, you can drive up to them. Like, you could, if you wanted to, you can take them down. Um, you know, and, and you're going to get caught, but the damage has been done. And to fix these things takes, you know, long, long lead times. Here's a crazy little tidbit to that chip, which you, so Elijah in California, one of the things that struck me really weird when I bought my house and at my wife's parents' house, when I first realized it, 
all of their like uh, electric boxes and the amp control is on the outside of the house. Whereas in Pennsylvania and everywhere else I've been on the East Coast, it's all on the inside out. So like a lot of weird things about that, but like immediately my mind always goes to is like somebody could literally walk right around to the side of your house, throw your throw your thing off if it's not locked. And most of these houses don't even have a block. Like the mains are locked because that's controlled by the electric company. But like to me, that was like wild, you know, especially like even imagining that in like the environment in Pennsylvania with snow and rain. And obviously that doesn't happen here in California. Well, this year it's been very rainy, but you know, like that's kind of was like one of those things that was like a really weird little nuanced chip, you know, to the, to that point. Yeah. That was weird too. I, I noticed that the when we, when we were starting to look at homes out here as well, I, you know, they do make locks for those boxes. Yeah. I, I locked and I locked the shit out of mine right away. <laughs> but it's pretty easy to cut a lock too, yeah. though, to be quite candid than breaking in a house. Correct. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and unless your power, you know, your security system is, is backed up with batteries or some other, you know, auxiliary power, like, yeah, you could, you could, Oh, I didn't even think about that. All yeah, those security your, systems your, are down. Your cameras are running off of, yeah. So you can just go flip the breakers. Seems like there should be massive crime sprees in California. I, do you don't hear about them? Different topic for another day, <laughs> boys. <laughs> I was going to say, like, the ways in which California's grid, coming back to your question, is going to change. It's just going to be more distributed in every way, in, in generation, in storage, and consumption. It's going to be localized. And that's not at all how the grid is built out today. But that is going to eliminate a lot of those hazards that are caused by those large transmission lines that are energized to isolated communities. If you can kill power to the transmission lines and still support that community in a, in a localized community grid, then those hazards, you don't need to underground them. You can just build resilience in the places where you have customers and, and in doing so, you know, eliminate those hazards from the environment. It's interesting from a technology perspective, one of the, the big paradigms that has been built up over the past, I don't know how long, maybe five, 10, 15 years is microservice architecture, but it's the same type of idea of rather than having one monolithic code base, that's doing all the things you start fractionalizing out the different pieces, and then they all come together for a collective objective, but it is fractionalized. And therefore if one goes down, it doesn't bring down the entire system. And I think that even what you're talking about with building homes and also power on, on a nuclear level, or even uh, homes that are generating energy and self-sufficient, but can also give back to their community or give back to the, the overall grid. The same recurring theme is resiliency through diversification, resiliency through spreading out this distributed infrastructure to make more sustainable systems that, that again, are, are resilient to attack or just, it doesn't even have to be attack, but resilient to catastrophe. Yeah. And there's so many, there's so many unique business opportunities here. That's all I'm, I keep thinking about, you know, there's a high barrier of entry because of the cost of capital to get into these fields, but Chip, are there any cool companies that you got your eye on or any ones that would be cool for us to look at or doing anything that are, is exciting you right now in any of these spaces? Yeah, there are a number of players that, I mean, <laughs> you're not going to be making terribly much money on the, the big players because they're their 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 market values cap is is quantified but there's a, a really interesting level two charging operator that's utilizing blockchain to enable charging as a service or, or pay to charge networks where you do not have internet so um you're you download their app it's called zeal x-e-a-l uh, X -E -L. yeah and and they their their blockchain technology you know it when you when you check into the charger, your phone connects and exchanges the, the 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 token or the key. That then, when you return back to internet service, that transaction takes place. Um, whereas right now, in order for somebody who's hosting chargers to be able to charge customers for that service of providing the charging, they have to have network connectivity, which makes it really hard and urban environments where Tahoe. Tahoe or, you know, the opposite of urban environments, Sierras. the Sierras, even in parking garages and, you know, in Manhattan, like 
you cannot get cell phone service down there. So you have to either bring in, That's you know, a modem and an electric, you know, a, 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 a telecom service, or you have to be able to solve that problem in an asymmetrical way, which is what Zeal's doing. Um, the other folks that that are really exciting, I, I love Nuvi. They are a V to G. What Nuvi, is it? N-U-U-V-E. They're a vehicle to grid charging operator. And what they do is they operate hardware. They're they're really a software operational company, but the, the charging platform that they've designed their systems on is, is to enable vehicles to send power back to the grid. Um, Interesting. And they're they're the like at home or like only on their platform. Well, it would their stuff works at home, but their real market share is in the fleet space. So where fleets that are that have been historically operating diesel fleets, there are grants and so forth, market forces such that transitioning to electric drivetrains is is very beneficial and. Would a fleet be like taxis School or buses. enterprise car rental or like what's School a fleet? School buses, fire trucks, you know, buses. And the reason why those vehicles are really what they're targeting is because they have a lot of downtime. They're, they're vehicles that spend most of their lifetime parked. And if that, and this is where, you know, my, my statements about the right sized distribution being about 50% electric to 50% hydrocarbons from just like an economic and a resilient, you know, a country's resiliency perspective, it might be under under allocating because when those vehicles are parked, they have massive batteries, which are available generation sources for grids. And when they when you pair a school bus, an electric school bus, with chargers that can deliver that electricity back to the grid. Your school bus that's three door, three blocks down the street can literally power your home when you have chargers that can send power in bi directions, in two directions. Yeah. Um, and so that you know that's that's their space. I really love the ideas of distributed home V to G, like you see in the the Ford Lightning commercials, where you're backing your home up off of your truck. But scaling that up such that you can back your neighbor's home up with your truck. Um, and the reason I say that is the power wall that's on the side of our house that has met all of our energy needs from a residential perspective um, is one tenth the size of the battery in my Rivian that's parked in my driveway. And so hmm. if that car had the ability to deliver that power, that, that power, I could power. 10 of my neighbors in a power outage with my one car and my one battery for so you know cool. a day or two, um, which is more than we need. You know, it's like these outages, they suck, especially when you- And if everyone has one electric vehicle yeah. and then you're living off grid for, for a month as a community. Exactly, yeah. And, and when your neighbors have those assets as well, that rem removes the need for the utilities to overbuild their energy storage capacity. And so, you know, to the extent that there's a massive, you know, in market shift happening, it's 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 in the investment of storage, and the storage is also electric vehicles. Do you think like do you think like a company like Nuvi will be able to solve it for like all EV vehicles, or do you think it looks more like a specific EV electric vehicle company like produces a vehicle and that's the first take of it we get yeah so the the interoperability on the vehicle side is really oem dependent so whoever makes that vehicle has to select hardware that's compatible with bi-directional charging um, which is why those those school buses are kind of like their first market because that use case is like tailor-made for this so those va those those manufacturers are by default selling they're making their vehicles with that functionality because that's what increases their value proposition far and away above the diesel competitor and it increases that value prop for the co the customer to convert their fleet the rivian does not have bi-directional charging capabilities your tesla neither of your teslas have bi-directional charging capabilities 
And so this is going to continue to change. I'm optimistic that they'll be able to retrofit some vehicles. And if the OEM can't, I'm confident that there will be aftermarket, you know, service providers that will make a non V to G vehicle V to G compatible because it's just so much value on that. That's gone without being captured. And that's okay because like, this whole V to G thing is so new in its in its whole life cycle that there's not a use case to really warrant that additional capex of putting that functionality into consumer vehicles today. But there is that that value for the for the fleet use cases to have that functionality in in those vehicles today. Yeah. How cool would it be if you could just pull your Rivian up to your your house on your ten acres? Plug it into your house, power it for a week. Go home. Te- technically speaking, you're plugging your house into the Yeah, Rivian. plug your house <laughs> into the Rivian. I mean, that's literally what it is doing for me today. Even though I can't send power back to the grid, I'm running my electric chainsaw off of the back of the Rivian and I'm towing, you know, it's, 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 right. yeah, I mean, it's, it's. Oh, are, did, are there battery packs, like extra battery packs that you can like, bring with you in cars to charge i always thought about oh, yeah. that. i never looked into it well, are there are they like actual efficient ones where like you could get like a 50 well, or 100 you can plug straight into the rivian with a power outlet they have power outlets no 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 into... i mean like like a battery pack talking about like a jerry the back of my tesla yeah. yeah 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 like i put it in the back of my tesla i break yeah. it out i plug it into my my tesla if i need an extra 100 miles or plug in my electric batteries they do exist. They're really, really expensive. Nobody would buy them for themselves. Um, there's a company, I don't even remember their name, but it's right there on my tongue. Anyways, they they provide they that as a service. Or are they like dirty? Yeah, they're selling them to like, like AAA this. so that AAA can bring those to a broken down Tesla instead of towing it to a you know a charging station. They could just top it off. Uh, but again, like battery storage, or sorry, battery energy density is not to the point where you know yeah. the, the whole bat the yeah it's 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 just it's not there yet i've seen more people yeah. putting a gas powered generator on a platform on the back of their tesla than i have seen <laughs> their you know, electric <laughs> battery <laughs> jerry can that's awesome yeah. that's awesome i mean that's awesome talk about a retro yeah kit. well yeah. when when the grid fails and you know, OEMs are still delivering cars. They have to deliver them with full batteries. And so I'm not going to name names, but I've charged electric vehicles with diesel <laughs> generators at scale and yes. quarter numbers. So, yeah. That's crazy. That's awesome. it's, uh, hey, you got to shit. You got to deliver. Right. One more question on this topic, because you mentioned something that was really interesting. You said that the battery capabilities, I'm just like summing up in high level terms, are not quite there yet for it. I think that's a concept that I've heard a lot of, and I've always been really curious about it. And we've heard people like Elon Musk and other people talk about it. Is it going to get there? What does it look, can it get there? Like, is that even possible? And what does that journey look like right now from where we're at today over the next like couple of years? Saying it's not there is really just in terms of the density, you know, uh, capacity per kilogram. And so it is there in terms of a use case for a consumer vehicle. It's just not there in terms of having a reasonably sized external portable battery. Yeah. And what about my 500 mile toaster oven? Yeah. Yeah. To make your, is that to there? make your 300 mile toaster oven, a 500 mile toaster oven. Yeah. Is that there? No, it's not there. <laughs> and I don't think it should ever get there. And the reason being is I think that a much better use of our investment would be in the refueling infrastructure. So a bit of self-serving because at the end of the day, I do build this infrastructure for a living, but I don't think it's the kind of infrastructure that I build that is really the most, the, the biggest place for the investment. And this is happening right now with your dollars. The federal government has allocated five and a half billion dollars to spend on electrifying 500,000 charging stations across the country between now and 2030. That's happening. That team is built and they are gonna start spending those money, that money come September. The sad part, and this is where, you know, the capitalistic forces 
that are driving this transition now have so little creativity or confidence in consumers' ability to change the way that we think about refueling, period, that we're going about this and we're dedicating 80% of that $5.5 billion towards the wrong kind of infrastructure. We're putting 80% of our dollars into DC fast charging, which is replicating the gas station experience for electric vehicles, but doing it much worse in a couple of different ways. First and foremost, in the best of scenarios with even an 800 volt battery architecture, which is Gen 3 or Gen 2 EVs that are just now coming out, you're spending 25 minutes parked in parked in a parking lot that you don't otherwise want to be at to wait for your battery to fill up. It used to take you five minutes in a gas vehicle. And 20 minutes might be like the right amount of time for most people on a road trip to go to the bathroom, do bio, you know, stretch their legs, et cetera, and then come back and be done charging. But you should only do that when you are driving past the capacity of your vehicle and you don't have the time to wait to charge at an appropriate speed. Now, that's DC fast charging. That's where 80% of the dollars are going. And it's worse because the infrastructure does not operate as it's intended at scale. The gas stations of, of EVs break down constantly. Richard, tell me. How many times have you pulled up to a supercharger station, plugged in, and had to move stalls because it either was yeah. charging or that they're just like every every one you go to, there's like two or three that are out of exactly. You know? That's not the case with all charging infrastructure. And now I'll I'll step back. Twenty percent of that five point five billion dollars is earmarked for what I think is the right investment, the right technology to make investments on building out access to charging. And that's level two. It's not nearly as sexy and it takes you, you know, well, just in terms of like speeds, a DC fast charger, the wrong kind can output, let's call it 150 KW to 350 KW in most cases. Whether or not vehicles can accept that higher end of the power or not today is is not reality, but you know, that's the order of magnitude, 150, let's call it. Yeah, so conceptually for us, like a full charge in 25 yeah, minutes. Yeah, that's hand wavy. Yeah, 20 to 40 minutes. Level two is a tenth of that. And what you gain with, with this is a fraction of the cost to build the infrastructure, a fraction of the power demand on the utilities grid because you're only pulling a tenth of that power. And... In doing so, you can charge more, you know, 10x the number of individual vehicles with the same amount of power from the grid, and, and it's a fraction of the cost. So what that requires, though, is consumers to think about refueling their vehicles differently than we do with gas vehicles. The, what that paradigm where level two charging is everywhere you want to park park your vehicle and every time your vehicle's down and not not being used for transportation it has the opportunity to refuel what that means is you're going to be plugging your car in refueling every single time you park it and in doing so you're never going to go out of your way to refuel ever again unless you're driving past the the range of your vehicle's battery it's like the idea of with your cell phone of like having a charge on your desk and you always top it exactly. off so you're never out. Exactly. Case. You you change your relationship with refueling. My father-in-law, there's like a free charging station built at an elementary school yeah. here in Los Altos and it has solar and it's like probably a level two. I don't know if it's actually level two, but it's a lot slower. Right. But every single night he takes his elect, he takes his car over, plugs it in because it's free and then takes his little electric scooter back to his house. <laughs> And then picks up his car in the morning before he goes to work and he gets free charging every single day. Yeah. 
and lets it charge overnight. You know, it's a lot slower, but it's free and he does it every but day. What that does is with those lower charging speeds for longer duration, this is just like they taught us in COVID. It's flattening the curve. And what that does to the utilities grid operations is it gives them much more predictability to know when to fire up their renewables or when to tap into their demand response power and not have large peaks that require turning on the most inefficient source of generation, which is gas-fired peaker plants, um, and meeting those DC fast charging loads demand by firing up the hydrocarbons. Even in California, where we have got one of the cleanest grids in the country and in the world, like when when people plug in a Tesla supercharger in peak load for that utility, they are charging off of fossil fuels most likely. But if those people had charging everywhere they parked, they would never go to the supercharger in the first place. And not only that, but Parlay V to G and every single vehicle that has capacity with owners that elect to participate in a virtual power plant plugged into a charging port that has the ability to send power and take power, then on, on a whim, you can charge you know, a DC fast charged vehicle with vehicles that are plugged in on level two that charged up slowly off of renewables and clean up our grid. Um, by redirecting those dollars, the 80% that's being spent on DC fast charger, which is really just replicating the gas station experience across the country, um, versus building out 10 times that those number of ports, but not focusing on the long distance use case, focus on the everyday use case and build that new muscle memory for consumers to change the way that they refuel their vehicles and the way that they transport themselves. And in doing so, build a much more reliable grid. So the reason why, again, not, not just because of the impacts on the grid, but DC fast charging hardware is literally on the cutting edge of material performance. And that's why, Richard, those charging stations are always broken. It's not that every single one of them is broken. It's pushing material, you know, our, our, our ability to, to perform. And so what that does, and I've seen this from the inside, is it generates so much electric waste. The amount of modules, boards, silicon, you know, electronic components, heavy metals that go into just maintaining that infrastructure, the DC fast charging infrastructure, is the greatest crime in all of this. And why I think that it's an absolute that's, shame. that's never really actually seen by the average person, whether the user or otherwise. I mean, we have you no see idea. the downtime like charge. Yeah. Took, yeah. Yeah. But you don't yeah. see the, the yeah. modules that they're sliding in and out of these massive energy products that are, in some cases, just getting thrown away in the best of cases are just roadmapped to be recycled. And God bless Redwood Materials and everything that J.B. Straubel's doing over there. I cannot wait for him to actually get that behemoth up and running and, and recycling the electric waste that we've generated to date. Um, but at the base, like we can stop throwing good money after bad and and level two infrastructure, it's not like it's bulletproof, but it is 10x as re as reliable. And I I don't know about you, Richard, but it, and maybe you don't go to them because you have home charging, but I have yet to find outside of like outside of level twos that just the internet operability is not working, or you know the the cord has been cut because of some jack off that thinks it's funny, like they the infrastructure is a lot more reliable and and it's not pushing those material limitations and so it's just generating a lot less waste and and that's anyway so that's but it's it's just it's such a low low optimism perspective to think that like an american consumer is going to require a gas station user experience and trying to push material performance towards that 5 minute 8 minute 
10 minute charging cycle, which is going to in turn generate inordinate amounts of waste <laughs> compared to what we have today with our paradigm of 20 to 40 minutes. And, and it's just, it's, it's really disheartening to think about what that future looks like, but you know, at the, at the same time, you know, we can, we are seeing a lot of good things happen and we do need the DC fast charging infrastructure in the long term. I'm just a little, a, a little concerned about how early we're making those massive investments in that cutting edge technology and, and, and walking past some of the lower hanging fruit from a grid reliability perspective and from a charging reliability perspective, all because we have so low, such low expectations for people's ability to think differently about how they move through the world and, and, and interact with energy. Yeah, I think I think Chip just gave us our uh, our next investment here. I mean, it sounds like with all the capital that's going to be spent into these um, at DC charging stations, that the proper term to say here, there's going to be a lot of We're waste. Level. It sounds like be it sounds like being in the waste recycling business right now uh, is a good idea to start to try to figure it out. You mentioned you have a you have a friend. Doing oh, JB Straubel, one of the he was the original CTO, I think, of Tesla. He left in 2019. To go okay. start a company yeah, no, no, no. in Nevada called Redwood Materials. And he's literally doing this. Specifically, like his original intention and expli explicit purpose was to recycle the drivetrain from electric vehicles. But I'm sure that the technology that he's building is, is going to be able to leverage to recycle a variety of different sources of electrical waste or, you know, technological waste. Um, but I don't know that to be sure, and I can only imagine how much waste is being generated. So there's there's certainly not there there is a lane, and and Redwood Materials is not cranking yet. But Chip, do you know how to recycle these materials? I don't. It sounds like the three of us need sounds like the three of us need to have a conversation here and figure this out. <laughs> I mean, come we'll on. have to have you back on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's the shit. next thing, Chip. We got to go learn and figure out how we recycle these. I got materials. some homework. I got some homework to do. That's for yeah, sure. exactly, exactly. Chip, if people want to find out more about what you're doing, follow your story, get in touch, how do they find you? I am on Instagram as the underscore electric underscore craftsman, the underscore electric underscore craftsman. You can also visit my website, which is leerenewables.com, L-E-I-G-H, renewables.com. And I've got links there to the, the Patreon and, and the high level outline of that Lee Labs project. Admittedly, that project is, is quite a bit of a passion project. And at this point, very self-funded. So if there are people that want to see that happen on their timeline, please go there and, 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 and participate. And if you're called to a, a less re regular payment and support, you can donate via my website. But at the end of the day, you know, just do what you can with the resources that you can and at scale people making the right decision for themselves and for their family and for their communities is, is the most tangible way that they can support what I'm doing and what I'm trying to achieve. So even if it's a completely unrelated project, do for yourself and do for your family and we will do for each other as a function. I love it. Thanks for coming Thanks on the for show. Having me. Nice to meet you, Richard. Good to see you. It was nice to meet you, Chip. I had a lot of fun, man. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for setting this up. Thanks for being on this show. Cheers. <laughs>